We're back live at the IBM Storage Summit. And last week at SuperCloud, we talked a lot about chaos, multi-cloud chaos, cross-cloud, Kubernetes chaos. It's, it's a complex out there. So how do you attack complexity? We're here with Pete Bray, the global product executive at IBM. Talk about just that. Pete, good to see you. Great to see you too. So can you explain the good and the bad of Kubernetes? Oh man, that's uh, how long do we have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's because, a lot of good, but yeah, it's, you know, you indeed. don't just, what's that, that tweet? You don't just deploy Kubernetes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of goodness, obviously. It delivers the agility that the organizations need, you know. And what's interesting is to see this trend that's been, you know, transpiring as organizations, and this is kind of the bad part of it is, we're going through a transition period. Um, and organizations are, you know, wrapping their minds around this new technology, this new way of doing things. And it's not just the technology it's changing their organizations and the roles of the people in the organizations. And you know, I know we talked at KubeCon yep. in Amsterdam and we touched on this a little bit, but you know, the, the uh, advent of the platform um, is becoming very, very critical for these organizations. They're looking for a single simple solution to be able to solve these problems in this world of complexity that they're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think that when we were talking at KubeCon, it was really around platform engineering and yeah. how that was becoming a thing. Yeah. And the skill sets, though, are are just far and few between. What are what are the things that you're doing now at IBM to help kind of bring that together? Yeah, and and one of the big changes that has happened since we talked at KubeCon is now these organizations are looking not just for a platform for their cloud native needs and for their Kubernetes apps, but now they're looking, I want to bring my virtual machines over too. And this has taken off like wildfire, you know, and we work very closely, obviously, with our friends at Red Hat, you know, and they have a technology called OpenShift Virtualization, you know, based on KubeVirt, the OpenShift, or the open source product. Um, and we're working very closely with them to understand, you know, the use cases that these customers, you know, bringing these VMs over, want to be able to co-host not just the containers but also the VMs together and have a single substrate to support it all. And that's all on OpenShift on IBM Kit. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's really what Fusion is all about. Is you know. We'll support, you know, and, and, and again, talking about the complexity, on-prem deployment, you know, hyper-converged solution, but also a software solution that you can run anywhere in public cloud, on-prem, bare metal, virtual machines. You know, we give the ultimate in flexibility because we know that these organizations are going through this transition right now and they have, they have more questions than they have answers. Yeah, I mean, that is the, the you're talking about on-prem and wherever. It, and it is the enabler, if you will, for that cross-cloud uh, yeah. capability. When Kubernetes first came out, it was you know, relatively immature. You had other sort of container platforms that had these enterprise features. And of course, Kubernetes tried to keep it simple uh, and the, the committers and it, it worked. But now, Pete, it, when you start to talk about all this different estates and supporting different locations, you've got to build in those enterprise recovery capabilities. So what are those, what are the piece parts that you're bringing in to simplify things for customers? That's a really good point. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is, you know, th this overarching concept of both the applications and the data delivered as a platform. Um, and the ability to provide really to um, turn the data into a revenueable asset. You know, I've been reading a lot about your super cloud concept and how that touches on the importance of data and some of the examples that are out there. And it's really, it's not about the data itself, it's about what you do with the data. How do you massage it? How do you make it available? And so we have this concept called the Fusion 5. Um, and it's the, it's the persistence, basic capabilities. Can I store and retrieve the data? But do that in a cloud context. It's the resilience. How can I be assured that the data is going to be available when and where I need it? And I mean, we're all from the storage industry here, so you know, talking about things like snapshots and you know, backup recovery, disaster recovery, but doing that in a multi-cloud context and delivering those kinds of capabilities. The security, obviously, you know, we talk about cyber resilience, but there's even more fundamental capabilities around encryption and key management and user authentication that 
the expectation today is that that's just included with the solution. I don't need to bolt something on. And, and this is the recurring theme we're seeing from the customers that we work with is they want a turnkey solution. Um, we did a lot of research this last year with the customers that we have for Fusion. And that was the one biggest thing that they told us is we value the single platform that IBM delivers. It includes all the OpenShift. It includes all these additional data services. If I want a turnkey hyperconverged system, I can get that too from IBM, but I can also get the software from them. Um, <clears throat> the next area, which is really a, a key area, is data mobility. The ability to move the data together with the applications across clouds, on-prem, at the edge. This is a really a key capability that we're starting to see. And it's not just, you know, for replatforming or rehosting applications. It's also just for everyday needs, you know, being able to move data between app dev and app test environments into production and back and forth is very critical capability. And then the final area, which is really unique to IBM and a lot of our Watson her heritage, and I had to work in the Watson reference given it's IBM, um, but data cataloging. You know, I talk about all these other capabilities making it available and secure, but what good is it if you can't find the data at the right time? And so we have unique uh, capabilities uh, in terms of being able to catalog and label and tag the data so it's quickly and easily found. You got to do this, like you said, across clouds. So you have to have all those storage services and other services that you talked about, whether it's snapshot or, or, or encryption, and it's got to work the same. Right, it's got to have that consistent, where the super cloud comes in, it's got to have that consistent look, feel, developer environment. Um, and then the data cataloging, explain that piece a little bit more, because it's a hot topic these days. That just enables optionality, different data formats, different, different types of data. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, and there's stats that are floating around out there that you know, the number one problem for the data scientists today is, is, is not you know, how long my inferencing takes or not how long it takes to do model training. It's can I get to the right data quickly? And some of the estimates are like 80 to 90% of their time is spent just trying to find the right data. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that we solve. Uh, you know, on ingest, we're able to tag and label the data so that later they can run queries and they can quickly find the right data set at the right time. Yeah, so. it would seem that, again, it's taking it from being a storage platform to being that data platform yeah. and really evolving that. Yeah. And that is that working in concert with a lot of the open shift from the Red Hat and what they're doing underneath the hood as well? Yeah, and, and in fact, I'm going to steal Dave's, I'm going to riff off of Dave's concept of super cloud a little bit and talk about the super platform. You know, and, and by all means, I think nobody would argue that OpenShift has you know, got a big leadership position in the Kubernetes space. Um, and that clearly addresses the application side of the equation. Um, and even now, you know, with this OpenShift virtualization capability, being able to bring in existing VMs, host those while they're going through their transformation to become cloud native applications, we're also providing the data services that go along with those applications. So now you get both in this super platform, as I call it, that you can run anywhere on any cloud, on-prem, bare metal, you know, whatever you need. So the you talked about earlier about the skills and the, well, the roles. So, so how does this, what you're doing, what are you hearing from customers in terms of how it affects their ability to actually get to deployment, get to value with you know, less stovepipe skills? Yeah, and it's interesting to see the industry change and individual customers change and make these realizations. They've realized that the traditional skills aren't going to carry them into you know, the, the next decades. Um, and so they have to change. And the way that they're deciding in going about this is rather than trying to take existing people and retrain them, and, and this is a consistent theme we hear, you, know, you talk about the good, the bad, the ugly of Kubernetes is it, fundamentally it's a new technology mm -hmm. and it requires a new set of skills and retraining. Um, what 
you know, CIOs have realized is I need a separate organization that addresses this and addresses it more holistically from a platform standpoint, thus the name, you know, platform. And we have now platform architects, platform engineers, you know, who are charged with building these solutions. And a lot of it's being driven by the challenges that these organizations have, you know, trying to figure out, you know, do I repatriate, do I, you know, you can do, say it. You can say yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> do I move, you know, applications around? You know, what about my public cloud costs? You know, how do I optimize that entire, you know, environment kind of leading up to, you know, the super cloud concept? Um, you know, they're dealing with that challenge and they've realized I've got to have an organization that is focused on this, that is peaked in skills, that really understands these technologies because they are different in, in, in many ways. But what's really cool to see though is now this new capability to be able to support these legacy environments alongside these new environments. It helps remove some of that complexity that they have to deal with. And you're definitely seeing in the marketplace so more of a, an e equilibrium or a balance. You know, you know, the big theme earlier this year was cloud optimization, people trying to sort of reduce their cost. You know, database has been a big driver of cost, not just not just compute that shows up in the surveys. And yeah. and and I think there's more data in the cloud than a lot of the cloud guys would have you believe. You know, they say, oh, it's only 10%, <laughs> much, much higher than that, you know, yeah. we think. And so as a result, the stuff that should have moved to the cloud I think most of it or much of it has moved. Okay, I think we can right. pretty much agree on that. There's a lot of new activity and new innovation going on in the cloud, <clears throat> but a lot of the stuff that shouldn't move to the cloud is probably not going to move now, especially because you get that cloud operating experience yeah. anywhere. Right, right, yeah. And I, and I think you'll see this that, I mean, <clears throat> we talk about hybrid cloud, it, it's real. I mean, it's because of the points that you just made. You know, there's there are applications that are best <laughs> you know, meant for on-prem environments. I think the you know the, the the whole super cloud concept it really is what hybrid cloud and multi-cloud envisioned, yeah. and it's now coming to to fruition. Of course, you inject AI and in, and in, it just brings a whole new conversation. What do you what are you hearing from customers in that context? Absolutely, and they are looking, you know, how can I monetize this, this data asset that I have? And AI is a key integral part of being able to do that. But even like, you know, Kubernetes is a brand new technology. AI for a lot of organizations is still very new, you know, and, and this is the challenge for us at IBM is we have to get outside our own echo chamber sometimes, you know, we're, we're immersed in all these different technologies and we have to remember that sometimes at the end of the day, the customers, you know, they're not that advanced yet, by and large. You know, there's, there's a lot of customers that are, and they grab it very quickly and run with it. But we need to help them, and the way that we can help them is deliver simpler and easier solutions. And, and one of the points about Kubernetes, you know, the good, is it was a fundamental concept at the beginning of Kubernetes to, if it's automatable, automate it, okay? And that's really, I think, one of the key things that's going to carry us into the future with Kubernetes is the automation that's going to be built in and baked in. Yeah, I think that that's a big piece of it for me is that as I've talked to customers, especially once you get out of you know, the, the Fortune 500 and yeah. into the more global 2000, that those skill sets are just not there and it really, they. A lot of them, you know, IT has become platform engineering, but they're losing some of the skill sets even on the hardware side. Right. And I would assume that that's what you're hearing about bringing in and kind of being able to bring in whatever kind of solution they need is the easy button kind of concept that we were talking with one of your ecosystem partners earlier. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's the exciting thing, you know, being a techie guy, you know, seeing a technology like this go through this evolution and opening it up to a much greater market, you know, to help these, you know, the global 2000, like you talk about, to help them be able to achieve the benefits that the big guys are able to achieve. I want to share some data. You're talking about, you know, customers are still trying to figure out how to use AI. I have some data on large language models specifically, which is, you know, kind of a subset, if you will. It's ETR data and said, to what extent do you anticipate your organization will use generative AI LLMs directly from the companies developing them versus embedding, embedded in existing vendor offer, offerings. The number one response was, I'm not sure. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so by far, 
But for those who felt like they had a handle on it, it was you know very much balanced. You know, it's kind of equally. You know, some say all from the direct, others say all embedded, but most are saying it's going to be in balance. And when you look at what they're doing with these large language models, you talk about monetization. They're largely monetizing through productivity improvements. They're saying, well, it's helped me write copy, it's giving me drafts, it's saving me time. Right. Uh, it's, it, better it's, customer it's, service. Better customer yeah. service, chat bots, et cetera. As opposed to, I'm directly creating revenue from my data. Now maybe that's how it really plays out, but I, I feel like there will be yeah. some you know, genie out of the bottle that people go, uh, aha moment where people say, ah, okay, I actually can monetize this more directly, create revenue versus just cutting costs and be more productive. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking about this the other day that, you know, chat GPT is a, is a great concept, right? And it's easy to see some of the simple use cases, you know, helping people be more productive, but I feel like we've only like seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of the capabilities of that technology. And, and I, I think as technologists, I think we yet don't know like the full set of capabilities that that technology will be able to deliver for organizations. We're at the beginning of an era, I think, that you know the, this collision of all these multiple different worlds, but the data um, is really the key part where they're going to be able to monetize it. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think a big piece of it is also that people are looking at it and the personas that you're talking to, the people who are actually buying the software and the hardware are, are changing. And I, I think that if you give them too many knobs, that also gives them a, a chance to misconfigure things and cyber resilience becomes yeah. an issue for them. Yeah. Is that what you're also seeing? A absolutely, we're seeing you know the prevalence of the app developer, the data scientists become not necessarily the final decision maker, because at the end of the day, you know, IT is still very involved in the decision making process and carries a lot of the budget still, um, despite what you know some people might say <laughs> in the industry. But you're absolutely right; these new personas, they don't want to deal with the under under you know the plumbing underneath everything. They just want the easy button. You know, they just want it to work. I've got a job to do. I got to write my code. I got to test it. You know, push it through the pipeline and you know, publish it to production. That's all they care about. You know, it's interesting, Pete, is it's all forever in this industry, we've had abstraction layers. I mean, virtualization was an abstraction layer, Kubernetes, you know, we talk about, you know, super cloud is an abstraction layer. Now we bring AI to the, the equation. On the one hand, this is like the good and the bad. The abstraction layer makes things simpler, but then as you get into it, you can do more with it. You can push more data, you push it harder and harder and harder. And then all of a sudden there's all this complexity. And of course it creates great opportunities for yet another abstraction layer. I wanted to ask you about a little bit about roadmap fusion and, and OpenShift. I mean, IBM's done an amazing job of keeping the culture of, of Red Hat, you know, going. You used to work there, right? And now, you know, so, but it's a fundamental part of IBM's you know, strategy. It's go to market, it's capabilities, it's platform build out. So what does the future look like in terms of capabilities that you guys are developing in collaboration? Yeah, you're, you're going to continue to see refinement about, around this concept of you know, supporting not just containerized applications, but also virtualized apps. And there's a really good foundation there that Kubernetes has laid for us to be able to do that. Um, so you're going to see that probably more in the short term, um, but you're also going to see this concept with Kubernetes um, one of the, you know, the bad things is, you know, the multiplication of clusters in a Kubernetes environment and how do I manage that? And there's some stuff that we're working together with Red Hat on to enable the ability to manage hundreds of clusters. And we've got customers, you know, one customer case, case in point, 650 Kubernetes OpenShift clusters that they're running. And you know, that takes it to a whole nother level in terms of how do I manage that many clusters? How do I do upgrades? You know, how do I ensure that I've got fixes applied consistently in that entire environment? And so that's another thing. And, and what's really important about that, this whole multi-cluster concept is providing those consistent services that I talked about, the Fusion 5, the, the persistence, resilience, security, mobility, and, and cataloging in a consistent way across all of those environments. This is where you know, we start talking about things moving from just storage to data and data that you can consume. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that in our next segment. I'm, I'm actually excited to, to talk a little bit about how 
AI fits in that hybrid environment, just give you another quick stat, um, talking about this equilibrium or this balance. When you ask people uh, what percent of the customers are, are all in on the cloud, the number's like 14%. Yeah. So it's not that large actually, they're all in. Of course, smaller companies, et cetera, this is maybe a little bit biased toward mid-sized to large companies. But if you ask them what's that going to look like in three years, they say the same number, 14%. Interesting. So it's a hybrid world. Yeah. So Pete Bray, thanks very much for yep. coming to theCUBE. Thanks guys, as always. All right, keep it right there. We'll be back to talk about AI in a hybrid cloud environment. You're watching the IBM Storage Summit live from theCUBE's Palo Alto studios. We'll be right back. <laughs>